Hello and welcome everyone. Today we will present the second part that is the AMP C beta lactamase producing enterobacteria C. The IDSA guidelines how to manage them. So first looking at the production and the function, AMP C beta lactamase help with the cell wall recycling and they can hydrolyze the various beta lactam agents which we use in our clinical practice. There are three mechanisms which exist for increased AMC production in enterobacteria C. These are uh, inducible AMC expression, that is, there can be an increase of AMC production in presence of certain antibiotics like ceftriaxone, cefotaxim, and ceftazidim. This increase can lead to resistance even after just few doses of the antibiotics. The next is stable and constitutive expression. Some enterobacteria C have a constituent gene of AMC which increases in production which makes non-susceptibility to specific antibiotics. Next is stable derepression. Here you have mutation in the promoters and attenuators of the AMC gene resulting in stable derepression. So with the derepression there is increased production of the AMC genes. Next is constitutive expression. Organisms like E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Salmonella exhibit constitutive AMC expression through plasmids or chromosomal integration. So the next part that we need to deal with is which enterobacteria C should be considered at moderate to high risk for clinically producing AMC due to the inducible AMC gene. If your patient has infection with Enterobacter cloacae complex, Klebsiella aerogenes, Cytobacter frondi, then you have a high risk for developing AMC. Resistance develops in these organisms when exposed to ceftriaxone or similar antibiotics. The low risk organisms are Seracia, Morganella and Providentia. So the guidance for less common pathogens that is Hafnia, Cytobacter, Yersinia, we should rely on the sensitivity results and consider cefepime over ceftriaxone when you have a high bacterial load, especially with these organisms. Now monitoring for resistance, clinicians should monitor for resistance of emergence during treatment, especially if the initial response to the therapy has been inadequate. Next is what features should be considered in selecting an antibiotic for infection caused by organisms with moderate to high risk of clinical significant AMC production due to an inducible gene. Now, in this case, as we already know, the risk of induction of AMC gene is higher with beta-lactam antibiotics like aminopenicillins, first-generation cephalosporins, cefomycins, because these are potent inducers of AMC gene. Now, AMC hydrolysis resistance by AMC beta-lactamases is crucial in decision making of selecting antibiotics. Now coming to specific antibiotics, imipenem is a potent AMC inducer but remains stable against AMC hydrolysis due to stable acyl enzyme complexes. Ertapenem and meropenem have similar stability to the hydrolysis as imipenem but their induction potential is not very well studied so we don't know for sure where atapenem or meropenem are AMC inducers or not. Piperacillin tazobactam, ceftriaxone, ceftadizim and astronam are weak inducers but they are susceptible to hydrolysis by the AMC making them less effective for these infections. Cefepime is a weak inducer of AMC and resistant to hydrolysis making it a very effective treatment option. So out of all these agents if you have to prefer one agent so you can prefer cefepime if your organism has AMC. Now next is alternatives. Alternatives that can be given are trimethoprim, sulfonsuccosol, fluoroquinolones, aminoglycosides and tetracyclines. Next what we go is the what is the role of cefepime in these infections where there is a clinically significant AMC. Now here what we need to see is a AMC here, cefepime is suggested as a preferred treatment of infection with Enterobacter cloacae, Klebsiella aerogens, and Cytobacter frondi. Now, carbapenem 
should be considered if the MIC is more than 4. Epipime is stable against AMC and has low AMC induction, making it an ideal agent. Therapeutic failure with cefepime may be caused by suboptimal dosing, group production of ESBLs or outer membrane porin mutations. Now clinical trials directly comparing cefepime with carbapenems are unavailable. Observational studies show similar outcomes. Meta-analysis found no significant difference between clinical outcomes with cefepime and carbapenem in enterobacter. Now, Cefepime is suggested as a preferred treatment in these infections because of its advantages and lack of clear failure in literature. Now, ESBL E infection, if it is ESBL, then you should avoid Cefepime as it has more chances of failure. Caution is advised when using Cefepime for infections caused by organisms with Cefepime of MIC 4 to 8 range, especially in the context of a potential ESBL probe production. So the next antibiotic that we need to look is the role of ceftriaxone for infection with enterobacterias at moderate to high risk of significant AMC in production. Now ceftriaxone is not recommended for invasive infection with high risk bacteria. Now however it can be used in uncomplicated cystitis with these infections where susceptibility has been demonstrated. Now difficulty in accurately identifying AMC producers due to lack of endorsed detection methods and confounding factors of ESBL production and study design make studies very very difficult to do. Now approximately 20% of the infections caused by these organisms exhibit resistance emergence after semtraxone exposure. Now, comparative effectiveness studies focusing on ceftriaxone resistance emergence, while observational studies show no significant difference in clinical outcomes with other beta lactams. Now, many studies have limitations like varying infection sources, severity, and treatment regimens. So, the panel suggests that considering the risk of resistance emergence, it is generally advised to avoid ceftriaxone in any kind of high risk infection. However, it may be used to treat uncomplicated cystitis with these organisms. So the next is the role of piperacil and tazobactam in this group. Here it is not recommended to give piperacil and tazobactam in this particular population that is who have inducible AMC. Now tazobactam is main problem again over here because it is less effective in, in protecting beta lactam from the AMC. The role of piperacin and tazobactam for treating infection caused by these organisms with inducible uh, AMC production remains uncertain. Now there have been conflicting trials which have not clearly shown any differences in terms of outcome but considering the fact that piperacillin and tazobactam are not very good in combating these organisms, piperacillin can induce AMC production and tazobactam is ineffective in preventing hydrolysis, makes this an inappropriate choice for this group of bacteria. The next is the role of beta, beta lactam, beta lactam inhibitors in these infections. Now, the preferred use is septazidum avibactam, meropenum avibactam and the other ones uh, can be used, especially if there is carbapenem resistance. There has been in vitro activity and septazidum avibactam is likely to be effective against AMC with some concern about slight failure rates compared to ESBLs. And cefidirocol is also having good in vitro activity and it is also good against the AMC but there are some case reports showing resistance. The use of septolozane tazobactam is not considered because again because of the weakness of tazobactam and this can be considered in a setup of polymicrobial infection similar to the ESBL. Now next is the role of non-beta lactam therapy in these infections. So as we go it can be used in uncomplicated cystitis that is nitroferentroin and trimethoprim self-methoxazole. For aminoglycosides can be used for the pyelonephritis and complicated UTI where nephrotoxicity risk is acceptable. Now 
plazomycin clinical trial has been done and it has been shown to be non-inferior to meropenem in these infections. Regarding the role in, in invasive infections, uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole and fluoroquinolones can be used to treat. However, it has not been evaluated in robust trials. So, once the treatment has been done, oral therapy to be started when the organism is susceptible and patient is hemodynamically stable and there is insufficient uh, intestinal uh, lack of concern of insufficient intestinal absorption. The avoidance of certain oral agents has to be done especially if you have an AMC infection that is nitrofurantoin, phosphomycin, doxycycline, coamoxiclav because they do not have reliable serum concentrations to deal with AMC organisms. So thank you for your patience and in the next class we will deal with the carbapenem resistance enterobacteria scene.